Uh, okay, let's try this again. There we go. There we go. That seems like it should be working. All right, sorry folks. Just, uh, you know, first time here, first time presenter. All right. Well, well uh, welcome everybody. I, uh, yeah, can see. Okay, thank you very much for the feedback. Uh, all right, well, without further ado, my name is Adam Bellmare. And today I'm going to be talking to you about event-driven architectures and the data communication layer. And I need to, there we go. Uh, so first we're going to start talking about uh, some of the communication structures involved in a business. Uh, there's three of them. And this, of course, is a gross simplification, uh, which I, uh, I'm hoping just to use to illustrate the points. Uh, so what, what, like, why do we have a business or an organization of any sort? You know, what, and this is basically to come together to uh, become very efficient at certain tasks, right? And in a quintessential uh, example business, uh, you may have certain, um, what do you call them, divisions, such as uh, finance, sales, support, uh, engineering, which, uh, you know, builds things. And you have these overarching responsibilities. And we do this division of labor in such a way that we end up with uh, communication between these divisions. Uh, but we also end up with a bunch of communication uh, within these divisions. Now, communication between these divisions is important because this is typically things such as, um, aside from the examples on the screen here, you know, uh, when will you be done these things? Uh, how can we coordinate our efforts? Uh, how can we ensure that we're all working together to achieve the same things? And what you're typically going to see is a structure that looks something like this at the business communication level. And this is where we have very intensive communication within a business unit and within a team, right? The sub teams that form up these units. And we have communication between them as well, but this inter-team, inter-unit communication tends to be uh, a, bit, a bit more formal, a bit uh, less frequent, a bit sparser. But this model here is, uh, is, is uh, replicated in many different parts of businesses and society uh, all across uh, our organizations. So an implementation communication structure relates to this business structure. And this is how do we optimize the processes that lead to whatever it is we're trying to do. An implementation such as uh, this example here, this is an example, this is a business process uh, model notation uh, example. In this one, we're, we're looking at uh, fulfilling payments. Now, obviously, real payment fulfillment will probably be a bit more complicated than this, but of course, I had to fit this on my slide. Uh, but what we have here is we have a more detailed description along with some of the processes involved of, of how we want to fulfill this business function. And this is leading towards uh, how we implement this. So in this case, you can see that we have the, uh, implement, uh, the BPMN diagram from the previous slide. We have this available at the top of our screen. And this is basically illustrating that this is uh, going into the, the, these monoliths here, and one of those or the other. And the implementation of this business process goes into our application code, goes into our data structures, uh, creates new data structures, new data models, and it becomes a hardened. And it hardens around uh, that what we that process that we want to do. Now, there's many different ways you can implement. Uh, you can, uh, like many fast-moving startup companies, perhaps you you end up with perhaps more of a spaghetti monolith with a lot of tangled dependencies. You may end up with something a bit more uh, delineated, where you have independent modules and more separation of concerns. 
Um, obviously, there's many, many, many ways you can implement something. These are just some of the common ones that you'll see here and there. But one of the reasons why I chose the monolith is that I think it is probably the most familiar to everybody as a whole. I mean, obviously, it depends on your audience. Um, and it's not even a bad way to do things. But there's a certain uh, there's certain things about it that uh, that induce you to put that implementation alongside all of your previous ones. So in this case, we have a new thing we want to do as a business. This is a new thing we want to do, um, whatever it may be, completely arbitrary. Usually we add it into a monolith or we'll add it into another existing service. And this is not even necessarily because this is the best place for it to go. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And best is obviously a bit of a subjective word. Uh, but one of the reasons why it often ends up in there is because you need data or you need access to data from other modules, other components, other data structures within your uh, service. And that alone, the fact that it may be there only or in part because of getting access to existing data sets and structures is a very limiting factor. And this is where we look towards the data communication structure. And it's uh, quite simple of a question, right? How do we get the data we need for business processes? And this is an, a, a, a sort of an abstract question. It's um, you know at the high level. But there are certain things we're generally looking for. We want, uh, I just realized now there's uh, one thing I should add before I mention these three, but we want it to be the correct data. We want it to be fresh data. So we don't want a copy that's you know, uh, at maybe an hour old or a day old or a week old. Um, we generally want it to be as, as relevant and as pertinent as possible. Uh, we need to be able to access data uh, at scale. And this is not just by volume, but from different business domains. Uh, now, obviously your requirements may vary, but for example, one simple requirement is you want to take things such as sales, uh, inventory and uh, predicting, like uh, take those things, group them together and then figure out predictively what things do we need to purchase uh, more of in the future. And ease of access. And this is just to make, like what's the point of having a data communication layer if it's hard to get the data? So traditional data access, uh, there's a few ways to look at it, but so we copied one. Uh, I, I gave you like a, a sneak preview there of one, right? The monolith, and you're gonna you might add stuff there because you want to get that data uh, out of the existing monolith. Uh, but other other things like right, like where do I get to, where do I get this data? Right? What is this, and where do I get it? So many of you are probably familiar with what I call an ad hoc data communication structure, and this is uh, data that you you've gotten it on your own. You, or, or you got it because you know your friend in the other cubicle over there knows, hey, if you go to this service, they seem to have copies of it. And there's many, these are not a, comp a comprehensive list, but there are many different ways to get this data and they tend to be uh, very purpose built. And they kind of fall under the idea of you reach in and you grab the data you need and you do whatever it takes to get that data. Now, Sometimes you end up with a bit more uh, cooperation, let's call it, and you can get uh, maybe your monolith, your major big upstream monolith that you need to get this data from. You can get them to make some read-only replicas, right? Or you can get them to schedule dumps of data at a period, and you know maybe you can get these things. Uh, but you still end up with certain issues around. Uh, you're you're still coupling on the internal data model. Uh, you're still re reliant on. Uh, coupling to their read-only replica, and perhaps you have to share this replica with many other teams and, and your performance needs and theirs like clash. And so there's a variety of things you can do, but all of these are sort of a band-aid. And a lot of these are simply because you're using the implementation, which is really good, 
at getting a business process, you know, done up in a fast, efficient way, but it's not very good at helping other processes that may exist in the company get read-only access to that underlying data. And of course, this is what the entire ETL industry is built on, uh, taking data from databases, transforming it and putting it somewhere else. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of them and they all go left to right for whatever reason. And so this is not a problem that has been conclusively solved. And it is a problem that I think that a lot of the existing solutions of making it easier just to extract data and put it somewhere else, they're sort of missing the point here. And the point here is that why do we need all these custom built tools to do all this when we can just be a bit more uh, preventative at the start and, and make data more accessible? And data is typically treated a bit as a second class citizen. Uh, it's sort of a form of exhaust that, uh, or a byproduct that comes off of a um, comes off of an implementation, and 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 there's just not a very good cohesive strategy around it. I typically have found. So now we're going to take an aside into event driven basics, just because this underpins how we're going to look at uh, the monolith or sorry, not the monolith, uh, the data communication layer. Sorry, sorry. So the first important thing is that uh, the events of the data communication layer, the event streams that we're looking to build, they're business facts. So these are things that have happened in our business that are uh, important and that underpin exactly what it is we're doing as a business. So for, uh, for example, in the e-commerce space, you may have... Uh, events that declare how many units of stock a certain product has. Uh, and you may also have events that declare this user has placed this order, this user has done this thing, or this store has sold out of these things. And these facts, though, they underpin, uh, they are the building blocks that we use to, to share uh, what's going on in our organization. Now. This is a short presentation, so I can't really get deeply into modeling stuff. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, we would focus on business entities. And entities are things, uh, like I gave in that previous slide there, like uh, the shop, the user, uh, payments. Um, these are generally objects that you're dealing with. Uh, Non-entity events tend to be things that are relationships between these entities. And uh, there's a very simple flight example here. And, and it's not always cut and dry. It's a little bit of like, it's a little bit of science, a little bit of art. So in here we have stores and items, and these are entities. And they have uh, all the properties about the store and all the properties about the item contained within them. Now this sales event stream has a relationship, right? We we have sold this item from this store and here's some price info and some payment info, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you could leave sales without a primary key, but you may be concerned about specific fields of a sale uh, and you know maybe you wanna issue refunds in the future and so you need like a receipt ID. And so you could also model it as an entity. Now, these modelings depend on your business, like how you're going to model it, if it's going to be an entity or if it's going to be an event. Uh, you know, what are these going to look like? And just for clarity's sake here, entities are events. It's just that an entity is a unique uh, representation of something, whereas an event, uh, you know, there could be many events, many sales um, where you don't have that primary key. Now, if you're familiar with the star and uh, snowflake data modeling in warehousing, stream modeling is very similar to that. Uh, but once you have these entities, what do you like? Why do we have these? What, what are these facts for? Well, this is where we start looking at the event broker with these event streams as the single source of truth. And this is significant. And this is a bit of a cultural mental shift. Uh, because we want to ensure that people have the ability 
services, I should say, or people have the ability to source their data from one reliable place. They don't need to go looking. This is part of that ease of use for getting this data. And this becomes a very, very powerful pattern because a consumer no longer needs to worry about, is this the truth? Is this the right source? Is it gonna be updated? Is it gonna be maintained, monitored, managed, et cetera? Now, the caveat is that the producer that owns the original creation of this data, so whether it's the blue database or the red database or the black one here, they too need to ensure that they produce the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, the event, event streams or immutable logs, um, just to be clear, we're talking about the immutable log. We are not talking about a queue and we are not talking about queues where when a service consumes the event, it's deleted. These are not deleted events. These are facts that are published in an append only way. So the partitions and uh, in the streams here, um, data is added to them and it only ever gets larger with, uh, you know, within reason you can, there's some things you can do to ensure they don't grow a ridiculous amount. Um, but basically the services that consume from them are responsible for maintaining their own pointers as to where they've consumed from. And they manage, uh, they're responsible for ingesting their data. So again, this is not queues and this data is not temporary, it is permanent. It is kept there as a permanent record such that a new service coming up or a service that had some bugs in it, they can go back to a point in time and reprocess all that information again without having to disturb any other services or systems. We also use these partitions that I alluded to on the previous slide. Uh, we use them for scalability and for data locality. So if we're dealing with um, you know, hundreds of terabytes of data, uh, any particular instance of a service can subscribe to just a small subset of that information and process it locally. So there's some data locality uh, options that are presented there. And this can help you also ensure you have uh, um, sufficient throughput to make sure you can keep up to date with events, of, up to date with changes. And again, I kind of have to go through this bit a little uh, quickly because uh, you know it's, like I said, a shorter, a shorter time slot. Importantly though, the producer has a few responsibilities. Now the producer needs to ensure that all data of a given key, a key is a unique ID that represents that entity. So for example, um, my, let's say my, my name, my country of birth, my birth date, and uh, whatever national, or if I have like a national identifier number of some sort, that would be like my key. So all events for me have to go to the same partition, all of them. Now what this ensures is data locality. So if you wanna know anything about me, you only have to listen to one partition. Any updates for it, will it be there in sequential order? So this is very, very important for ensuring that consistent ordering and to make sure that you know where all that data is for any given key. Uh, the producer is also responsibility, or sorry, is also responsible for consistency. And the data can be eventually consistent, but it has to be consistent. It can't be wrong. The producer can't write stuff to the event stream that it doesn't use internally. And anything it uses internally that should be exposed must be exposed. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about those boundaries uh, later. But uh, if the, the basics is that if the producer has a different set of information than the event stream and it never reconciles, um, you have two sources of truth. And when you have two sources of truth, consistency goes out the window. Um, and you can have a lot of data consistency problems amongst downstream systems and, uh, and it just becomes very messy. So this is, a re this is an absolute requirement. Additionally, uh, although some people I've seen and some teams and architects have, have break this principle, I do not recommend it. Single writer principle is pretty straightforward. Uh, for any given entity, 
or event stream, there's only one owner, one single solitary owner that can write to it. Um, you don't let another service overwrite your data. Again, this is how you get conflicting sources of truth. Now, schemas are typically used and should be used uh, when producing this data. This is very, very important because the intention is that the, any consumer of this data should have enough context from the data itself and from all of the um, metadata, descriptions, taggings, et cetera, of the schema to fully interpret this data and to fully understand what it's reading. If you, you, never, you never write anything in there that can't be easily understood by the consumer, because the point here is to provide that flexibility, but also things such as data discovery, um, ensuring that consumers can understand any, any uh, corner cases that may be in the data. So schemas, uh, whether Apache Avro, which is the one that I favor, or uh, Google Protobuf, which is also quite, quite good from what, I, what I've seen, uh, those would be the kind of schemas you're looking uh, to use. So now for the consumer responsibilities, one is the offsets. Consumer manages its own offsets from the streams it's reading from. Uh, if it wants to reread stuff, it's up to the consumer. If it wants to store these offsets durably, uh, typically, whether using like Apache Kafka, Pulsar, Kinesis, all of those uh, event brokers, they will they will let you store it internally or you can also go store it in durable storage yourself. The consumer is also responsible for, <clears throat> excuse me, for materializing, building, maintaining its own state. This means that the event stream doesn't care what you do with it. Once you get it, that's on you. Uh, but you are, but it is not the producer's responsibility to provide you a state. It's not the data communication layer's responsibility to provide you a state. It is strictly up to the consumer. So what you may see, uh, for example, just uh, maybe this might help frame it. If you have a set of users as entities, right? So myself, Adam. Now let's say I'm, a bad, I'm bad at parking and I get lots of parking tickets. So parking tickets are keyed events. They have a key and it's probably the ticket ID. But what I want to do here is I want to take all the tickets that I would have now I want to take my user, which is me, right? So I materialize myself, which means I, I just go right into the state. I sum up parking tickets and I store that. And then I join them together and boom, I get out how much money I owe. So this is a simple example of how you can take disparate streams that may mean different things, combine it into some sort of application and get some business value. Yes, this looks a lot like an, uh, an ETL pipeline, an extraction transform load. Um, one of the things I have found, and I have been thrilled to hear many other uh, software developers and data developer, um, sorry, data platform developers, data scientists uh, observe, is that in a lot of event, in, in pretty much all event driven systems, uh, and mo anything that really has to do with streaming or real time, everything's going to look like an ETL. When you start mixing in users, um, like with uh, acting uh, synchronously through uh, like REST APIs, and you start mixing that into the mix, things get a little different. Uh, but you're generally going to find that in any sort of environment like this. If you're like, hey, this looks like an ETL. Yes, you're right. It does because it really is. But the principle here is that we want to treat this domain event as a first class citizen. We want to make it available. We want to make it well defined. We want to make sure it's consistent. We want to make sure it's available. And then we can decouple. And again, does this mean that any everything should be written to an event stream? I think you all know the answer to this. No. Um, as a real life example, uh, one of my previous employers that I worked at, uh, Flip, which I'm going to talk about a bit more later on here as a real life example of what we did. Uh, we had some 650 odd tables, I think, in our monolith, one of our monoliths, one of our major monoliths. And after we 
basically did the things that I just talked about in the, in, so far in this presentation. We had about 60, 50, maybe 60 uh, individual entity and important event streams. So a lot of the data within that monolith was, is still encapsulated within that monolith strictly for that monolith. These are only the important things that are important to the business as a whole that we were uh, liberating out. And again, yes, you make your data accessible by getting it to the event broker, your single source of truth, uh, the place where you go to get this data. So how do we get this data in here? Because I tell you, okay, put it in there and you say, well, that's nice, Adam. But like uh, like you said, we, you know, we have a monolith and it has 650 tables and like that seems like a lot of work and where do we start? And you know, I don't even know if this is gonna fly. Well, it's true. There's, there's many, many things to consider. Uh, how do you get that data out? How do you get that data out for systems that are still critical that maybe you don't even have under active development? Uh, how do you get that data out for systems that are under extensive active development and you can only devote so much resourcing? So generally, and this is a gross exaggeration, not exaggeration, generalization, but this is what I tend to see. This is what I've seen at numerous different organizations uh, and with discussions of peers and colleagues. But we generally start with the forked right anti-pattern. Someone says, okay, let's just put this data in the event stream. This is easy. We're just gonna write it. So I wanna store this blue triangle in my data store. And, and then I'll write it to the event stream. All right, so I stored it in there. I go to write it to the event stream. I get a failure. Maybe the network fails, maybe the producer fails, maybe it's trying to write to an event stream that doesn't exist. You know, any number of things can happen, but eventually this producer, which may be serving its own, you know, doing its own work in real time says, okay, I give up, I can't handle this, I'm failing. But now we have a problem. Now we have an inconsistent source with an inconsistent event stream. This is the producer's responsibility to reconcile. And I mentioned this earlier, but this bears repeating because this is so important that um, you must not you must not mix this mix this up. So another option: what if you write it to the event stream first? Well, I'm sure most of you know where this is going. Maybe you end up with a failure there. You have a bad call, you know, bad column definitions, your own bugs, etc. Again, they're inconsistent. So what can you do? And this is where options come in, and this is where trade-offs come in. So one option, well, why don't you just write it to the event stream and keep trying until it gets in there. And then you read it back from the event stream into your database. This is one thing you can do. Won't this slow down the application? Probably. Won't this prevent me from using some database centric features? Probably. Is this the best way to do things? Not at all, not necessarily. In many cases it is, but not in all cases. But again, these are the trade-offs that as a engineering team, as a company, as, a, as you know, the, the many different producers and consumers of data uh, within an organization, this is the, the important conversations to have. How do we make this stuff accessible? What is it that we do? Another option, and this tends to be after the, the forked right anti-pattern has uh, caused some production problems, let's say, you know, with various systems reporting different data than others, and you generally have like an outage. So change data capture is another popular one. And what change data capture is, is a purpose-built system uh, that consumes from a data store, that pulls it, and processes some data and writes it to the event stream. So the change data capture service is taking on the ownership role of ensuring that it's consistent. Now there's many advantages of this. Uh, for one, you can connect to pretty much any data store, whether it's a relational database, document database, uh, you know, a NoSQL DB, there's pretty much connectors for all of these things. It's scalable. You can scale it to uh, very high volumes of data. You can scale it out to many different uh, services within your company. You can even hook it into legacy systems that are no longer act under active development, which is uh, one of the big selling points that uh, 
sold it to me originally back, back when I started doing these uh, things. And finally, of course, it enables our single source of truth, which is the whole point of why I'd be doing this in the first place. Now, obviously, there are some downsides. The first is that this polling loop is two words, and it, there's a lot packed into that. So there's a lot of performance impacts that can occur, particularly if you want to backfill data from, you know, you want all the data in that database in your event stream, or in a particular table, I should say, in the event stream. Well, I mean, you may have 10 years of data. You know, that could be 150 terabytes. So if you start querying that out of your, out of your producer service, if it's your uh, main production database, you can cause some very serious performance impacts. Uh, additionally, incremental changes, if someone does a, let's say you're using a Rails database and they do a, a large migration and it touches every, every row in a table, well, you might find out that you end up reprocessing that entire data set again. And, uh, and of course, that can be quite problematic. Uh, you couple on the internal data model because the nature of change data capture is that you reach into the database and pull out the data you need. And although you can somewhat design around that, typically what happens is that the internal data model just gets exposed. It's quick, it's fast, it's easy to do, uh, but it's also a good way to introduce some unintentional coupling. Change data capture service does not come for free. You need teams, you need people, you have to maintain it, you have to nurse it. Um, often, Times you'll end up with breakages in it from various reasons. You might run out of memory. You might have problems connecting to a service. You might have problems connecting to the sync. Uh, and there's a lot of costs associated with that, uh, both financial, uh, personal, and opportunity. And there's also some idiosyncrasies with it. Because even though we can create a, a single source of truth, for, ex for example, hard deletes. If the producer just flat out deletes a row from its table, it's gone. When you go to poll that, if you're using a polling based system, it's gone, data's gone. You don't know it's gone because it's been hard deleted. So the event stream now deviates. And again, once you start deviating, uh, that single source of truth is, is less useful. So it's not that it's not, Change data capture is not useful. It's that there's a lot of caveats that you need to be aware about when you're using it. But this all comes down to like, what is it that we're willing to do? And there's trade-offs, there's performance trade-offs. There's, you can have the producers um, use other patterns that I haven't talked about here uh, to get more consistent data. So there's many, many options, but these all come to a, how do we, what data is important? How are we gonna get it in there? What are we gonna do? So. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm pulling up against my time boundary here, so I'm going to go real quick. Uh, here's an example from Flip's migration. Flip uh, deals with circulars and flyers, uh, basically like e-commerce-y stuff. Um, so what we did in the past was we wanted to add, let's say, coupons. Again, we put it into the monolith because we needed to read a bunch of this information. Now, the problem is that once we put it in there, it's sort of hard to get it out. And in the future, we wanted to make sure that we had more flexibility. We didn't want everything to have to be a Rails application as well, particularly as we were looking to enable things like Go. Um, we were doing a bunch of Scala-based stuff, uh, JavaScript as well. And so, again, so when I was talking about those read-only uh, rep, or sorry, the ad hoc communication structures, we had all of them. And we, and I mean, I'm no longer working there. I know they probably still have a few. Uh, but all of these ad hoc things were painful, problematic, they'd break, we'd have to fix them, and every new service sort of needed its own new one. And so what we did was we started with a uh, forked right pattern, had some mistakes there, we moved on to change data capture, and eh, kind of didn't really like it that much, and then we moved into finally native production directly to these event streams. And we would expose things like flyers, the items in them, which merchants and stores, into these event streams which then let us decouple and migrate the applications and the services that used to use these ad hoc data structures. And we could migrate them one by one and we could do comparisons to make sure that we're still getting consistent information. But then it also, as we would expand our event streams into new, uh, you know, the new business lines that are business 
was going into, like coupons was a big one there. Um, it just gave us the ability to take our existing data, what we already had, you know, add some of the new domain that we're moving into. And now you can just compose whatever services it is you need. Uh, we built item detail services. Uh, we built and experimented with a few different search services, uh, coupon service. And in this case, these services are also serving front end, but uh, we also had a quite an extensive back end of event driven stuff to do a lot of our like asynchronous processing of flyers and events and data coming in. So again, I, you know, by now this is ad nauseum. How should you access important data? Please think about this. Uh, what trade-offs are you prepared to make? Again, conversations. Uh, you know, the whole point of this data communication layer, I think it's great. Composition is awesome. You should use it. Uh, and by making your data available org wide, you un so this is an important thing. You unlock a ton of different options, but you don't really restrict anything. You don't say you have to do it this way. It just makes it so you don't have to rely on these uh, ad hoc data communication mechanisms. You have this formal one and everything becomes a lot easier to do, business change, et cetera. Uh, here's my, my shill. I wrote a book. Um, this is, I talk a lot more about these options in here. This is event-driven microservices, but this is all underpinned by this data communication layer. Um, I'm sorry that I only have a few minutes left for questions, but I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me, uh, please go forth. Thank you, uh, thank you guys. I'm glad, uh, I, hope, I hope you appreciated it. <laughs> Sorry if I was a bit, uh, a bit fast paced, but uh, I didn't wanna, didn't wanna take up uh, too much more of your extra time. Um, I'm all, uh, I mean, I only recently signed up to Twitter. Um, I'm not the greatest at it, but if you have any questions, feel free to tweet them at me, I suppose. Um, yeah, but otherwise, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll wait here for an, a few more minutes if anyone has any questions. Uh, but otherwise, I hope all of you have a great day with the, the rest of ApacheCon uh, or wherever you may find yourself going. Thanks, Alex. Hi, Kai, yes. Is Kafka more suitable for an org or can it also be leveraged by a team? Uh, so honestly, you can certainly leverage it for a team. Uh, in fact, the humble, my, or my original exposure to Kafka started with very humble beginnings, um, for, uh, a team of, oh, not even 10 people really. Uh, and we were predominantly doing, um, we were basically bootstrapping real-time streaming into some experimental stuff. And that's sort of how it's how it stayed with us for a good year or so. Um, in fact, it was easier to sell it to the org after starting uh, just internally with our team because we were able to demonstrate um, some of the things that did very well, 
but we were also able to demonstrate uh, you, you know, where we would need support, like infrastructural support, uh, you know, estimations on server costs, et cetera, like that. So um, the real answer is, is, is both, absolutely both. Uh, did I did I deal with any replay of historic data before? Uh, yes, yes, actually, quite extensively. Um, generally, we would replay historic data when. So when in the flip example, which I think is is a pertinent one, uh, any new services coming up uh, because flyers and flyer items, merchants, stores, because those things were such important aspects of our business. Uh, any new service coming up would end up consuming all of that historically. Uh, but sometimes we would also have to do uh, code changes, business changes. And those changes uh, would basically break the internal data models that we currently had. So instead of trying to migrate the data models over, which could be problematic in some cases, uh, we would just bring up a new application instance, rebuild it all from the historic data. And then once we were satisfied that everything was looking good, we would swap over to using the new one and get rid of the old one. So uh, historic data was was regularly uh, regularly replayed. Yeah, yeah, Robert says he's done that a lot too, yeah. And, and what's, what's also really cool about that is it is the it is the same for what I would call disaster recovery. So if you have a uh, if you have like a, an application and a and it catastrophically fails and you don't have any snapshots and you have to bring it back up, you'll already have an idea how long that could take because you're you know you're used to replaying this historical data and you know that like worst case scenario, we're gonna have to replay it all and this is what it'll be. And then you can decide if that's good enough for your service level of service level objectives or not. Yeah, and um, it's kind of cool because it's the same way, you know, whether, whether you're building a new app, whether you're changing and refixing bugs, whether you're recovering from disasters. Uh, so having that, ex yeah, uh, what does Robert here say? Replay allowed our architecture user, do you, does, yep, yep. And for testing, yes, and also for testing, uh, you can use the same sources of data to to pull that information in, test it, and without worrying about affecting uh, production, without you know making any mistakes there. So once you get that communication available, it's just very very useful. Uh, Kai, when you rebuild from historic data, what are the practices and recommendations you have to complete it safely and quickly? Right. So this is where. So if you're do yeah, I have a steady nerve. <laughs> so if you're doing this for disaster recovery purposes, uh, I think my best recommendation to you would be try not to get into that scenario in the first place, which kind of sounds a bit uh, evasive. Um, but for example, if your uh, consumer, ha let's say you're using a consumer where you're materializing your data to like a managed relational database. You can take snapshots of that and you can store the offsets of your consumer in those snapshots. So in a worst case scenario, if you go down, you can say, okay, restore yesterday's midnight snapshot and, and then replay from there. So the snapshot restoration will be as fast as it normally is, but the restoration will be very short. Now, if you're in a situation where you have to reprocess from the very, very beginning of time and you have no, no you know, there's no magical outs here, um, this is where a bit of foresight is needed. So the number of partitions you have will be a limiting factor. 
and the number of and, and how efficient your processing job is for consuming this data and doing work with it. And there's tends to be a bit of a, uh, I find a bit of a struggle, let's say, between infrastructure that may manage these servers and, and pay for them, right? And the teams that want it to be as absolutely fast as possible. So if you have, say, a terabyte of data, yes, you could have a thousand partitions and it would go very quickly with a thousand parallel instances processing it. But that's sort of like financial overkill, especially if in steady state you could get away with uh, the a parallelism provided by only one or two partitions. Um, so that again is a, it's a matter of trade-offs there and it, it kind of depends on the business requirements. So if you have a very hard service level objective and it says it has to be at least one hour or sorry, it has to be a, a maximum of one hour for um, and, and generally, you'd kind of need like a sort of benchmark job. You need something to measure it against. And you'd say, okay, so we have to be able to reprocess this in one hour, and this is our benchmark job. So then you do some napkin math, the amount of data size you have, whether your topics are compacted or not, and, and sort of how fast you expect it to process. Do some division, and you're going to end up with a partition count, you know? Uh, you know, maybe you double it then. And that would sort of be working backwards to ensure that you would have enough capacity so that if you do get in that scenario, you can rebuild. Yeah, and, and like what Robert is saying here is perfect. He says, uh, it's crucial for infrastructure to understand the business drivers. For example, if profit is generated entirely at peak, infrastructure needs to accept over provisioning and yes and so again it there's you know there's no free lunch here it's it's really it really does depend um but this is why i always advocate it's best to it's best to sort of do a defensive approach where you 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 know ideally don't get into that scenario and i think with modern day cloud computing especially with being able to take snapshots of uh, various data sets uh, that that your state may generate. Um, you're no longer so reliant upon an individual machine or server being alive. So like even if you lose all of that, yeah, if you lose a whole data center, for example, and with the cloud, uh, you're it's like, oh well, we lost the whole data center, but we still have your snapshot. So we'll just move it over to this, you know, this region and boot it up there and here you go. Uh, so so I would say like keep keep a look at those tools that prevent you from getting in that place in the in the first place. Yeah. Um, all right, folks, uh, uh, let's see, Kai says one more thing here, replay the whole history. Replay the whole history, scale up if allowed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so we successfully would, uh, we would store the offsets uh, within our, within our, uh, so one pattern we use is we'd store the offsets within the, within the um, snapshots. Uh, we also did a lot of stuff with Kafka streams where uh, we, we have change logs. So all the change logs are backed by Kafka. And, uh, and then you can basically, as long as you don't use, lose your entire Kafka cluster, which would be catastrophic in its own right, don't do that. Uh, you would have the ability to just relaunch your application, reload from the change log, uh, which is effectively your snapshot, and then off you go. All right, folks. I'm. Uh, it was actually uh, this was kind of cool. It was nice talking to all of you, but I have to get going. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to see myself. Um, but Robert and Kai, uh, it's nice chatting with you. And whoever else may still be here, yes, take care. Uh, thank you for the questions, and Robert, I appreciate your input. Thank you. Uh, you folks have yourselves a great day.